Армандар алға жетелегенде. Білім жетістікке ұласқанда. Шабыттар бірге шыңдалғанда. Бейік белестерге қадам басқанда. Омытылмас сәттерде өз арманыңды басқара бе. Ауэзов Юниверситет. События 2020 года. Пандемия. Самоизоляция. Локдауны. Да, но не только они. 2020 год – это плюс 15 тысяч шибановцев. Новые лаборатории и кабинеты. Новые возможности Smart University. Создан автономный образовательный портал с собственной системой прокторинга. Увеличено количество услуг Smart Arsu. Проведена неделя цифровизации. Достижения ученых. Учеными выиграны гранты на 160 миллионов тенге. Под руководством профессора Конышбека Шункеева разработан учебник по физике для школьников. And the uh, recipient of many uh, famous uh, scientific awards, including the Nobel Prize um, of 1987 for chemistry, uh, Professor Jean Marie Len. I'm honored to uh, moderate this talk. Um, so, uh, without um, uh, uh, further waiting, let's get started with the lecture. So, Professor Len, uh, floor is yours, please. Um, Please, you can get started with the lecture. Lecture today is, um, the title is Steps Towards um, uh, Life Chemistry, right? Okay. Yes, that's the title. <laughs> so right. I am happy to be, so to say, in Kazakhstan, although it would be much better to be there, really. But okay, that's a start. Uh, my lecture is very general, and I try to show how chemistry uh, is present in all the steps leading to life and to thought. But for doing so, we have to start very early in the history of our universe here. The Big Bang was the start of our universe. At that time, the universe was very hot, extremely hot. It cooled down very rapidly, but particles formed, but there was no chemistry. This was the age of physics, no chemistry, much too hot for that. Then after cooling down, expanding, about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, then chemistry started around here, the age of chemistry. Chemistry meaning that particles had formed atoms, atoms could get together to make molecules, and then molecules, began to be bigger, larger and larger, to assemble, to lead to sort of compartments and so on. And out of that, a new property appeared in the evolution of universe, which is around here, which is biology life. So life appeared uh, on uh, our, in, in the universe around that time. Now, um, The age of biology, it, uh, the organisms, the living organisms became again, they evolved, became more and more complex. And a new property appeared, a very important one is thought, thinking. That is why we are here. Without thinking, we would not be talking to each other. And this can be considered as steps towards life and thought. It is the evolution of the universe towards more and more complex states of matter. And as we know, we are human beings and other beings around the universe, because I'm convinced there are other planets around the universe where there are living organisms, where are thinking organisms, maybe some more advanced than we are. So I already want on this slide to stress that Although this is the end of the slide, 
It is not the end of the evolution of the universe. The universe will continue to evolve. It will continue to change. And new types of some things, of entities, will appear. But let's look at the universe as it is now. This is not a black slide. It's just indicating that in our universe presently, there is 68% of dark energy and 27% of dark matter, which means there's 95% of darkness. Not much to say about, except for the cosmologists who try to understand it. But there's 5% of visible matter, and this is the matter that matters. We are part of this 5% of visible matter. We are a part of the universe, but just 5% of the visible matter is where we are located. Now, these are big questions, of course, and the, the evolution of the universe came from divided matter to condensed matter, then to organized matter, then to living, then to thinking, and maybe something even more complex than our present way of thinking. As a function of time, the universe has become more and more complex in some regions. Remember, it's only 5% visible matter, but there may be some other possibilities, some other complex systems, complex states of matter. And that is evolution of the universe towards complex matter. One may say that it looks like a driving force is information and complexity. There are regions in the universe which have become more and more complex, more and more informed, especially those where thinking organisms exist. Now, the big question then we can have to ask, very important question, is how does matter become complex? How is it possible that in our universe, starting from the Big Bang, evolving progressively, matter becomes complex? to the point where it goes from elementary particles to a thinking organism, and maybe even higher forms of complex matter. This is a big question. And for answering this question, mankind has developed what we call science. <clears throat> science tries to answer this question. What is it this way by which matter becomes more and more complex and generates organisms which are more and more complex, even organisms capable of trying to think about how this happened. Now, mankind created science, and that's the answer. This is a way to try to answer this question. I would say it's the way. Physics deals with the laws of the universe. If you look just at three times, Part three uh, domains of science, physics deals with the basic laws of the universe. Biology tries to understand the rules of life. And what chemistry is doing is trying to build the bridge between the two. In other words, trying to connect basic laws of the universe to specific expressions of these laws in given organisms living organisms, thinking organisms, which may be different on different planets, but trying to, the basic laws of the universe are the same everywhere. The way they express themselves in different regions of the universe may be somewhat different. Of course, the laws are the same, but the rules by which they operate may be different. And chemistry has the objective, the mission, to try to understand how this can happen, how one can go from very general laws to specific expressions of these laws. Now, there's an answer to that question, a very simple answer, but it doesn't mean that we understand what's going on. It happens by self-organization. I think that our universe has an inbuilt ability to self-organize. In other words, to lead to more and more complex organization of matter up to the point where we are, at least on our planet Earth, up to the point of a thinking human organism. One may even say that's a cosmic imperative. This is a bit maybe um, more philosophical, but one can say, uh, 
And I would say that the structure of our universe is such that self-organization will occur and it's not an accident if there are living organisms. It is an imperative that our universe is constructed in such a way that organization will occur and life is a result of it. Life is an imperative, a cosmic imperative, like the general, like uh, thinking organisms. Now, chemistry is that science among the sciences which deals with the structure of matter, how it is built up, and the transformation of matter, how material entities made from the bricks of the universe will come back. We will see that in a moment. How can you transform objects of matter into one another? And this is a very interesting point. In fact, I'm a chemist because of that. When I noted that chemistry allows you to transform objects of matter into one another, be it non-living or living matter, this is a very strong feeling of, uh, let's say, sort of a power over organization of matter. Now, what is matter made of? Mankind was, uh, was very much involved and was thinking for a long time and we continue about how matter is organized. What are the bricks of matter? And along the times, one began to understand that there are pieces, entities, which are sort of the building blocks, the bricks. And this was a rather uh, complex situation where a number of people had been thinking how to organize these bricks, these building blocks, which we call elements. And um, in the middle of the 19th century, there were a, a number of proposals, but there was a Russian chemist, Dmitry Mendeleev, who in 1869, wrote the important paper, the, uh, the uh, game-changing paper on that. And that was here. This is the original paper as it is published in 1869. It is, was published in German, if I translate it into English, on the relationships between the weight, the properties and the atomic weight of the elements. Mendeleev had uh, noted that if you organize the elements according to their properties and their atomic weight, you come to a table which is shown here. This is really 1869 paper by Mendeleev where he shows the first, the, the first picture of organizing the elements which were known at that time. And for instance, you can see here, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, and so on. And in the, in the uh, row, nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, bismuth. So this is a way to organize this table. Now, this table is absolutely fantastic. I'm, I usually like to insist on one thing. This is one of the most important paper, scientific papers ever written. It organizes the elements in our universe. It gives a lead to try to put these elements into a table and organize the elements. And it is now, of course, a bit different, but let's see then Mendeleev even went so far as to put a question mark when he thought that there should be an element there which is not yet discovered. And of course, later on, it was discovered. So I would like to insist on that that this is a most important step in science for mankind and valid everywhere in the universe, of course. It is called the periodic table of the elements. And nowadays, here it is. That's what it is nowadays. The periodic table of the elements is the ground map of the elements in our universe and everything everywhere in our universe is made of these elements. These are the bricks of visible matter. I think, you know, it's a bit, you say, okay, that's another table, just a scientific table. No, no, this is much more profound. When you look at this table, you see the elements which exist everywhere in the universe. And the table is complete. That means 
there are no other elements. Of course, there are the artificial ones, which you can create in the accelerators and so on. But these are the elements in the universe. Hydrogen here, number one, is the same everywhere from, from the Earth to the end of the universe, if I may say. Boron, same thing. Carbon, also carbon. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, all these elements are the same everywhere. And the table is complete because you cannot insert anything between two elements because it's just like counting. You see, you see, for instance, here, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is just counting the number of protons in the nucleus and the electrons around the nucleus in the atom. So this table is complete. There are no other elements in the universe except the artificial ones, as I just as I said. And I think we has to realize that that mankind has been able to present the table, which will be valid everywhere in the universe. This is absolutely incredible. When I look at it, I can I always am, I I am so. Uh, admirative, I'm so, so 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 enthusiastic. I mean, how is it possible we we are able to know what the universe is made of? And this, that's what it is. Look at it. That's what it is. From here, from Kazakhstan to a very far galaxy or somewhere else. And this is the playground of chemistry. Chemists are like children, so to say. They play with these things and they combine them. And out of them, they make, they, they make connections, they make, uh, element, they make uh, entities which result from connecting the elements together, following, of course, the laws of physics, the, the uh, basic laws which, which uh, rule the way you can connect them. And I would like to insist that chemists, what they can do is to take these elements, to connect them, rearrange them, play with them, and make an infinite number of possible combinations. Now, from the atom to the molecule is the first step, and this led to the development of molecular chemistry, which results from the connection between these building blocks by strong bonds, which chemists call covalent bonds. Let's just say there are very strong bonds between atoms, which lead to molecules. And let me just then mention two milestones in the development of molecular chemistry, just to give an idea. In 1828, a German chemist, Friedrich Wöhler, made in the laboratory this molecule called urea from using a starting material, which is ammonium cyanate. So Wöhler did two very important things by doing that. First of all, he transformed ammonium cyanate into urea. That's a chemical transformation done in the laboratory. And second, he also showed that urea, which is contained in a living organism, in urine, is, can be obtained by simple laboratory experiments from another chemical compound, ammonium cyanate. In doing so, he showed that there is no difference in essence in nature between the elements, between the uh, molecules which constitute living organisms and those which are part of the non-living world. At that time, people were thinking that you needed a magic force called the um, vital force to do that, but it is not necessary at all. So he just showed that non-living world and living world are just a continuum. Now let's jump by 150 years or so. The, the production, the general, the um, making, the chemists call that a synthesis, the building up progressively of a very complex molecule, vitamin B12, which we have in our body. This is a very, very complicated molecule compared to urea, and it required the efforts of two groups and many co-workers one group was directed by Robert Burns Woodward at Harvard University in the USA, and the other one by Albert Eschenmoser at the Polytechnical School in Zurich in Switzerland. 
I was a postdoc with Woodward and I worked on one part of this molecule, this part down here, but there were many, many people working on it. And so it took the efforts of many men and women years to get this thing going, but it was done. And in, 19, in the 1970s, it was, uh, it was finished. That means the buildup of this molecule from scratch, scratch meaning from atoms, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, cobalt, there's a cobalt here, as you can see, there's some phosphorus here, there's one phosphorus here, and this then led to this making of this molecule. This was considered at that time as the Everest of um, synthetic chemistry, the art and science of making complex molecules from their building blocks. Now, molecular chemistry didn't stop at that. And in the last 50 years, of course, it made a lot of, lot of progress. It became a lot of new reactions were invented, new procedures, new drugs were made, new materials, many, many, many new molecules. So molecular chemistry is a very strong science, very adult science, and developing still very strongly. But we can then ask a question. Molecular chemistry being the how to that being the study of the molecules made from atoms, is there something else we should think about and look about? Let me introduce that by using a biological example. Here you see a blue sphere, which is a cancer cell. And you have two uh, violet here, pink uh, yeah, um, uh, cells, which are killer cells. Uh, these killer cells, are supposed to recognize, to find out the cancer cells and to destroy them. They are in our organism all the time, running around and trying to, say, to find out what has gone wrong. And if there are some cells which have been developing badly and being transformed into, for instance, a cancer cell, then they have to find it and to destroy it. Another example is this where the blue entities here, these particles are the HIV virus, which when, it, when the virus hits a white blood cell, it has reached its goal and it can infect. So the question then, I could have many other examples. The question here we can ask, how do the killer cells know that the other one is a cancer cell? They shouldn't make a mistake. If they, kill, if they destroy a healthy cell, that is no good for you. If they do not destroy a cancer cell that is no good for you. So these killer cells have to find out that the other guy, the other partner, so to say, the other entity is really a cancer cell which they are supposed to eliminate. Similarly, when the HIV, HIV virus particle hits a white blood cell, it has reached its target and can infect. What's going on here? How is this possible? It means that there is a sort of a recognition process because all these entities, all these cells are made, of course, of molecules and they have a membrane. And this membrane is like a sort of a soap bubble, uh, is made of lipids, uh, the, the same uh, sort of constituents like a soap bubble to be simple. And in this membrane are sticking specific molecules which, give, which, did, which show, which uh, display what the cell is, and the cancer cells on their surface have such molecules which can be recognized by the killer cells and therefore destroyed. So molecular chemistry, therefore, which deals with what the molecules themselves are, is then leading to supramolecular chemistry. That's what we introduced, a chemistry which is beyond the molecule, meaning that's the chemistry of the assemblies of molecules. What do molecules do when they get together? What is a population of molecules? What is the society of molecules, so to say? They may like each other, they may hate each other, they may repel, they may attract, and so on. And the supermolecular chemistry rests on the interactions between molecules, which are of, uh, of non-covalent type. That means when the molecules are built, they still have ways to interact, to uh, attract each other, to sit together and to interact and to form larger entities, which are supramolecular entities. 
there are three main functions which have been studied over the years. How do molecules recognize one another? That's the most basic one. What is molecular recognition? How do molecules find out what the other partner is? Then there is the reactivity and the transformation of molecules into one another and the transport of molecules carrying out, that means interacting together and being able then to transport one molecule by another one. The basic feature, the most basic one at the start is molecular recognition. How do molecules recognize one another? That's a complicated process, of course, but I can simplify it and give a simple idea of it. Molecular recognition involves, first of all, interactions. They have to bind, they have to feel each other. If there is no interaction, they, have, they don't feel each other, then nothing happens, of course. But this is only one point. The other very important property is there have to, has to be information. You cannot have a recognition process without information. In other words, molecular recognition, the process by which one molecule can selectively bind to another one, interact with another one, but with a specific one, is an information process. And this can then, how can we represent that? One can say that the simplest way would be to say that is a sort of a double complementarity between the geometry of the object and the types of interaction. For instance, plus attracts minus, plus repels plus, and so on. And in the, already many years ago, in times where I didn't speak much about interaction, but it was more mechanical, there was already an image given which was that of Schloss und Schlüssel, a lock and the key. The German chemist Emil Fischer proposed in a very famous paper in 1894 that for a molecule to act on another one, this, in his case, he was looking at an enzyme acting on its substrate. They have to fit together like a lock and a key. They have to be complementary. They have to attach to one another in, um, in a, in, in, a, in a way in which they uh, adapt and they correspond to each other. Emil Fischer got his doctorate at our university in 1874. And of course, we are very proud of the fact that he got his doctorate here. This, but this paper was later, this was written later, he had already left at that time. So molecular recognition is the basic process. There is no life without molecular recognition. If in your body, if you live, in your body, the molecules know what to do, at what rate, in which place, and so on. So without molecular recognition, there cannot be life. It is the basic feature by which molecules can do something specific, selective, and make life possible. Now, the most, um, the most emblematic type of molecular recognition is the following, is shown in this, in the genome of living organisms on our planet. The genome is uh, the way genetic information which determines the different organisms on our planet. This genetic information is written. How is it written? It's a long string, as you see here on the left, a long string which continues far, 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 many, many, many more units. And on this string, which is a rather simple string, there are fixed letters, which chemists have given name to. The letters are just chemical entities, chemical groups, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. These are just four letters, which for a chemist are very simple. They are sort of trivial almost. Yeah? They are very simple molecules, much simpler than vitamin B12, for instance. And the genome of all living organisms is written with just a sequence of these four letters, which makes the difference between a tomato and an elephant, or between a dog and a man, and so on. So this is the writing. This is the information in our genome. But how do you then read it? But how can I do that? The processing of this information is also very simple. It comes from pairing of the basic units, the basic letters. 
the letter adenine can pair up with, the, with thymine or uracil slide modification variation. And you see by forming two points of attachment, these little dots represent interactions which allow the interaction between this group on the left to this, with this group on the right. There are two points of interaction here. Then the other two, guanine and cytosine, interact in three positions. There are three points of interaction here. So in fact, what is happening is that molecular recognition occurs through complementary patterns where the letters forming the genome, writing the genome, can interact in a binary way. Two or three interactions, which make leads to the conclusion that really the genome of living organisms is very simply constructed and very simply processed. It is constructed from just four letters, not more. Of course, you can change them a bit, but the usual, the ones, the, the, the classical ones are four letters and two ways of interaction, two binary, a binary system with two, three, two, three. It's a very simple system. Now, why is it so simple? Possibly because it's enough. With four letters and two ways, two modes of pairing, you can write the information and read it. Perhaps in the course of evolution, more complex systems have been tried when we be five letters, six letters, you need at least uh, an even number because otherwise you cannot pair six letters, eight letters, and so on and so on. But this was probably too complex. It was, it gave chaos. It gave uh, uh, mixtures which were intractable. And finally, what survived was this simple case, four letters, two ways of interaction. And that is what we are coming from, human beings or microbes. Now, so chemistry is also an information science because there's a molecular storage of information and a supramolecular processing. It is the science of informed matter. Ma objects of matter, molecules, they carry information in their structure, in the way they are built. And this is the storage of information. The way they interact, the way they bind together, the way then to rec they recognize each other is the processing of that information at the supramolecular level. So I suppose you understand now well the difference. The molecules are made from atoms, they have a structure, and they store the information. The way the molecules sit together, get together, and interact, that's the way to read and to process this information. So I would say that in addition to be the science of the structure and transformation of matter, chemistry is also the science of informed matter, of information in matter. Molecular recognition then can be sort of uh, represented schematically by using the uh, lock and key idea of Emil Fischer. You have here three keys, you have a lock, and of course the red key is what fits best. Now, a lot, a lot, a lot of work has been done on trying to understand molecular recognition on trying to build keys for locks or locks for keys. And very many studies have been done in many, many laboratories around the world to try to understand the processes of molecular recognition. Let me just insist a bit on this now and see also what kind of applications this can lead to. Because basic research is to find knowledge. And uh, applied research is uh, applying this knowledge. So in the applications we can see in life sciences, first of all, is drug discovery. Because a drug may be considered as a molecular key which can bind to a biological lock. So uh, making a new drug, or let's say a drug, a, pharma a pharmaceutical compound, is a key which is supposed to to bind selectively, very selectively, to a biological target and to do something to it. Maybe to inhibit it or to, uh, to uh, enhance its activity. And this molecular recognition is the very basic way in which drugs operate. 
Then we have also over the years developed other types of things like for instance here, this is a case where we made a sort of a cavity here, a molecule which has a cavity inside. Inside this cavity, you can put an element which is called europium, part of the, of the periodic table of the elements. And this has a red luminescence. So if you attack this cage with the red, the red and luminescent entity inside and attach it to immunoprotein, you can develop an immunoanalysis system for medical diagnostics. This is a machine here, this apparatus is now used in a number of hospitals, in many hospitals, and uh, for diagnostics, for medical diagnostics. Then I spoke also about uh, transport processes. I said molecular recognition is, of course, the basis, but there are also other functions like chemical transformation and transport. I just show you here one case. A transport process of great importance is how to transfer a gene, which is a piece of DNA, just a simple piece of this double helix DNA, this the, the, the deoxyribonucleic acid, which I showed you on the previous slide. And uh, this piece of this piece of, uh, of of DNA is a gene which one can try to introduce into a cell, as shown here by, the, by desi designing synthetic vectors, which help it to penetrate through the membrane of the cell, go to the nucleus, be transformed into the, into the RNA, and then giving out the protein, which is the product. This is a way in which one can introduce a gene into a cell and then let it express, let it generate a given protein using the machinery of the, of the cell. Uh, this uh, means that this is uh, of interest for gene therapy to correcting, correcting for genes which may be deficient in an living organism and also for biotechnology. In fact, you have probably realized that it is a way to make genetically modified organisms, GMOs. And I would like here to insist, I do that every time I give this talk, I would like to insist that genetically modified organisms are a fantastic step forward. A number of people who now claim there has to be, one has to be careful. Of course, one has to be always careful, but they are not dangerous. We can control them. And we have to develop genetically modified organisms. It is part of the future of mankind to answer problems which will happen, which already exist. And uh, more food, making more food, They're also trying to use a, um, an organism for generating a drug, for instance, a protein, which is a drug, and so on. So I insist that genetically modified organisms are a very important part of the development. Then if we look at materials, I would just like to give you one example of a type of material which has been developed in supramolecular chemistry what we have called supramolecular polymers. Supramolecular polymers are a type of polymeric molecules, long molecules, which are based on the linking of small pieces by these non-covalent interactions. I would just like to illustrate how science can, from basic ideas, lead to very interesting applications. Um, supramolecular polymers, have been developed as biocompatible polymers by a small company, initially Xeltis, which made um, molecule materials, supramolecular materials, which can be used for deriving for cardiovascular implants, which can be used for the surgical treatment of children which have a cardiac malformation and need uh, reconstruction of their heart. And this has been done. We have published a paper in 1990. This was the first paper on supramolecular polymers, which we published in 1990. And the first application for these cardiovascular implants was developed when the, it was really done. That means the, the implantation was done in 2013. And here is the little girl who has been operated in 2013. Dominica, by, she has been operated by Professor Leo Bokeria in the Bakulev Scientific Center for Cardiovascular Surgery in Moscow on October 23rd, 2013. Here you see her three months after the implantation. 
She looks good. She looks happy. She's smiling. He's smiling too. Both are happy. It worked. And this is just to indicate two things. First of all, new materials can bring a lot of uh, positive outcomes for mankind, for uh, health. And uh, also, it took 23 years to do it. And you realize that, of course, if you want to introduce something into human body, there are a lot of uh, um, uh, a lot of steps to pass in order to be sure not to harm, but but can be done, and it may take very long, but because it a new comp a new type of material has been developed, it was possible to also develop these um, materials for surgical implantation. There's more than now many children, this is an older slide, so many more than 10 children have been treated, have been treated, and then also the company has also developed hard valves for pulmonary hard valves, which have been implanted in Budapest, in Krakow, and Kuala Lumpur, and probably somewhere else, I don't know all the developments. But I just wanted to illustrate here in a very striking example that basic research, discovery of knowledge, leads to applied applications uh, by using this basic progress to develop new materials and to then provide new materials and new means for, for instance, health. Now, if I can come back now to the, the theme that, as I said earlier, that self-organization is the driving force of our universe. What about now uh, going a step further? I have shown you how, at least by very simple examples and very, very briefly, how molecules can interact and they can then lead to, to an organization by this recognition process. Now, one can then try to go beyond this simple way of just making bricks which fit together, fit together in a, uh, in a recognition fashion, so to say, and try to use the knowledge which has been gained to generate systems where molecular recognition is used to direct the organization and the spontaneous generation of information controlled supermolecular architectures. It is, it is important to note that this happens by itself. That means self-organization, but it is controlled by the way, it, the way it which it is built. It is not just anything interacting. It's a very selective, specific interaction. Let me illustrate that by an example, which is the way in which a virus builds up. The buildup of a virus is um, the, the buildup of a virus, it happens spontaneously, but it is very well um, determined by the way in which the molecules forming the virus interact. You can see here there are bricks uh, here on the right hand side. These things, this is a sort of a cut through the virus, and there are 2,130 bricks, protein subunits. One molecule of the RNA of the genome of the virus in green hair. And these molecules interact side by side in a supramolecular way to generate a virus. In other words, the building blocks of the virus, these 2,130 subunits, components, those are the bricks. And the way they bind together leading to this thing here. And on the left-hand side, you see that like a piece of, uh, of cake here, and then uh, and attaching to one another, generating a, a, a disc and then a lock washer, and then having generating a single helix. This is the process, which is a super molecular process by build up of the virus. In other words, the virus is a self-organized complex entity based on bricks, molecular bricks, which are shown on the right-hand side, and they interact. So the virus itself is a supramolecular object re, uh, resulting from the selective binding together of the And this looks like, as you can realize, a programmed chemical system. This is a system which leads to uh, 
the uh, final entity in a spontaneous way, but it is programmed, it is controlled. It is not just anything. It is controlled by the way in which surface to surface, the building blocks interact and then automatically, but in a controlled way, generate the final entity. Now, these program systems, as I, I will just summarize what I already said, starting what I started with uh, DNA and the genome of living organisms, the program is molecular. The structure of the molecules gives the information. They sort of say the information is stored in the components. So the program is at a level of molecules. But the operation is at a supramolecular level, the way things interact. And one can even say there is an algorithm one can define, which is the pattern of interaction. The way things interact is the recognition algorithm. And so uh, living organisms are formed of molecules and these molecules interact in a given way, very selectively, and they perform recognition between themselves. Now, let me just show you a, a case where in the laboratory one has tried and we have tried, we still, what I will show you comes from our work, where one tries to um, build up systems, design systems, where the bricks, the components, can uh, build up into an architecture which is directed by the way in which they are brought together. Here, the case I mentioned is using molecules which are able to bind a metal ion, a metal like iron, cobalt, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, so a metal ion, and so the, the bricks are the molecules and the cement which links them together, which glues them together are metal ions. And using this, tech, this way of a, this approach, one can design organic molecules capable of binding metal ions in such a way that when the right, the correct, the appropriate metal ions are present, they assemble and generate a given large architecture, what we call, it's a bit a complicated name, let's say a metallo supramolecular architecture. In other words, a supramolecular architecture, which involves binding of the components by metal ions, that's why it's called metallo supramolecular. And let me show you, uh, there's a great variety of such architectures and many, many have been made around uh, the world in many laboratories. Here, for instance, you see, uh, <clears throat> we had this, the first ones we made uh, many years ago now, where this, this is a double helix. This is an artificial double helix. This, the, the blue thing and the brown thing are molecules which wrap around each other. You do not see the metal ion, it's hidden behind the molecule. You see it better on the right-hand side, the triple helix, where three strands are brought together by these red, these um, yellow spheres you can see here, and which links them together. So these two objects, and this is a real crystal structure, that's the real shape of these entities. They can be generated spontaneously by mixing together the molecules, what you see here, and the metal ions which bind them together. This is another case where this, the blue units and the red units are molecules which are more or less perpendicular to each other and at each intersection, three horizontal and three vertical, each intersection, they are held together by metal ions. In this case, there are three times three, that means nine of these metal ions, nine silver ions, which form this molecular grid, this the type of a grid-like structure. Again, this is spontaneous assembly. Here, a more complex one. You have here a linear molecule, three linear molecules, which are in red, four flat blue molecules in blue, colored in blue, and 12 connector units. Uh, and you see then you have three plus four, that is uh, seven here, 
and 12 metal ions. So you have 19 entities, 19 pieces, which go together spontaneously and generate the final metal, the, the final cage. This is a sort of a cylinder, a nano cylinder shown here. You just mix them and you get it. This is just, this is just a, say, a series of three others which look nice and uh, which are more complex than the other ones. And of course, this continues and many people, many laboratories around the world have, uh, have, have tried to uh, develop the, um, different systems which generate a number of different architectures which may have some functional properties and so on. What I want to, to insist on is that this type of approach is also very interesting for nanoscience and nanotechnology because you can try to generate in a programmed way, in a very directed way, controlled way, by controlled by molecular information, large supramolecular architectures, which are very well defined, which are organized and which can be functional. In terms of uh, technology, it may be a very powerful alternative, maybe not, but certainly a complement to nanofabrication and nanomanipulation. That means that you can try to use this technology of spontaneous buildup of complex architectures so as to generate a device from scratch by spontaneous assembly, spontaneous but controlled. I always insist on that. So it is the way to go from fabrication to self fabrication. Let the object make itself. And this is, of course, the ultimate fabrication. The idea here is that from the components, letting them interact, they would spontaneously build up the final device in a sequence of steps. Now, just to give you an idea about how this has evolved, and to give you just by, in two slides, an idea about what we are doing now and what is the state of the, of the art in this area in the developments. <clears throat> I have insisted for the moment on the design aspect where you design molecules con which display a certain type of information. These molecules can interact with others so that you can set up a programming way to let the molecules interact and to progressively become more complex, like the ones we just saw on the slides before. And this programming then leads to functional molecules, molecular and supramolecular entities. Of course, the molecules must have some kind of a property and the supramolecular entities then that bring, brings and uh, leads to this supramolecular object, which has, brings together molecular, uh, molecular building, building blocks and then this generation can be controlled by the way in which you design the basic building blocks. But one can then envisage another step, which is beyond this, which is to use a selection process. In other words, to say, can we let the system select what it needs to build itself up? For well, this, you need diversity. In other words, you need different building blocks in, uh, in order to be able to choose. If you want to select, you have to be able to choose. And we need dynamics. Dynamics meaning that you don't want when two objects get together, you don't want them to stick together too strongly because maybe the first collision between them has not been the right one, the, the best one, so to say in terms of uh, its selectivity and its energy, its, uh, its thermodynamics in scientific terms. So uh, this selection needs, relies on diversity in the objects and on possibility to dynamically dis dissociate and reassociate and so on. Now, this uh, leads to a chemistry which we call constitutional dynamic chemistry. It's a chemistry which it means the following, the constitution of the chemical object is dynamic. 
In other words, the constitution results from many things binding together, which can, however, fall apart and then reconstitute itself in the same way or maybe in different ways if there has been a change in the environment. So this makes possible also adaptation. So imagine that this, these constitutional dynamic objects, these chemical objects are formed from building blocks, which can dissociate, exchange, re be replaced one by another one. And then uh, if the conditions change, it may incorporate another type of building block. And that then results in adaptation and leads to adaptive chemistry. This is now the field we are mostly interested in. Can one make chemical systems which respond to the type of uh, agents which are around, like physical agents or chemical agents? And just to give you in one slide a, a sort of a panorama of what's going on, but not I cannot talk about more about this right now because it would be much too long. So this um, constitution dynamic chemistry is the chemistry of the objects which are able to modify themselves by exchanging components in a reversible way and therefore respond and adapt to uh, agents in the environment. They can be physical agents like temperature or pressure, and they can be chemical agents like some kind of a molecule or a metal ion or protons and so on. Three types of applications or three types of uses have been made of this idea of constitutional dynamics, of, of, con of, dynamic, uh, of dynamic entities built up from different pieces, from different components. On one hand, one has been able to develop uh, new strategies for bind finding out biologically active substances. Dynamic nanostructures, this means uh, st structures of nano size, which you can fall apart and reform. And then development of dynamic materials, uh, which have then properties which static materials do not have. They can have self-healing, they can be responsive to environmental effects, adaptive, and so a new area can here be developed, which is to generate adaptive materials and adaptive technologies. And this is the way towards adaptive chemistry. Now, <clears throat> this indicates that if you want to look at the evolution of chemistry along the years, Molecular chemistry is, of course, what you start with. You want to build molecules from atoms. Then comes up supramolecular chemistry, where the, uh, the, uh, the objective is to study the way in which these molecules can get together to generate supramolecular architectures with a given function. These are organized because the selective interactions between the molecular objects leads to an organization of the supramolecular object. They should be better if they are dynamic so that they can fall apart and rearrange themselves so as to be able to perform adaptation leading to adaptive chemistry. So that's the way towards complex matter. And um, this is uh, the development, I uh, give you a line of development of chemistry, molecules, supramolecular entities, organization, dynamics, and adaptation. I would like now to finish with some general considerations. First of all, I hope you have understood that chemistry can make things which do not yet exist. And this we call create. Chemistry is not just here to discover what already exists, of course, that is important. But chemistry can create novel expression of complex matter, novel expressions which can be quite different, which are new, which have never been seen before. So chemistry is able to write the book, not just to read it, and to compose the score, not just to play it. So chemistry is a very creative science, like art. In the same level of creativity, it has a lot of creative power. And uh, I here would like 
to show you just this picture of Auguste Rodin, a French sculptor, which in fact, I should have mentioned in my slide of the universe developing towards uh, sinking organisms, because at the end of the slide, there was this other, this other famous sculpture of um, Rodin, the sinker, the person, the sinking person, the sinking organ, okay, the sinking human. And here, one has the hand of the sculptor uh, uh, ex um, transforming the stone into a sculpture which was not contained in the stone. The hand of the sculptor expresses out of the stone this type of sculpture, which means that it is the creativity of making things which did not exist before they were made. And so chemistry can be considered as uh, and the art of matter, as expressing from the objects of matter, from the atoms, the molecules, the periodic table, all these combinations, which are represent new objects in matter, new material objects, new entities. This kind of conclusion had already been expressed many years ago by a very famous person, Leonardo da Vinci. <clears throat> you know, certainly the Gioconda, the famous painting, which is in the Louvre Museum. But I cite him here for another reason. Of course, you know that Leonardo da Vinci was a scientist, an engineer, and an artist, of course, a painter. And so it was his 500th anniversary two years ago in uh, uh, 2019. And um, the, uh, as you can see, he wrote this very famous sentence, where well, nature finishes to produce its own species. That is part, it is what, the, what has happened in the universe. And we are part of that. Huh? We are products of the evolution of the universe of nature. But then comes some point, a very interesting reflection. Man begins using natural things. These natural things are, of course, the bricks of matter, the bricks, the elements of the periodic table of the elements. In harmony with his very nature, that simply means in harmony with the laws of physics, the laws of the universe. You cannot go against these laws. But then comes the ending, which is a very strong ending, especially for an artist, to create an infinity of species. Leonardo da Vinci had here suggested and uh, stated that mankind can create what has not been created yet, what evolution of the universe has not led to. There's so many different other, other combinations which can be set up and mankind can do that. The scientists can do it. So creating uh, objects, noble objects, nowhere expression of matter is at the hand of the scientists and of course the chemists. Let me just uh, show you here, um, this person, this is Prometheus. Prometheus was one of the gods who stole the fire of knowledge and he wanted to get, give it to mankind. He is running away. This is in Greek mythology. You, I guess you have heard about this. In Greek, in, in Greek mythology, he's running away here with the fire. But the other ones who would like to catch him did not catch him, so Prometheus was able to give the fire of knowledge, to transfer it to mankind. And here he is showing high this fire, brandishing this fire and showing the fire of knowledge to everybody around. Now, one thing is of course that knowledge is the, uh, what we try to gather, what we try to, to gain by doing science. On the other hand, of course, we already, we also realize that you cannot give it back. What you know, you know. You cannot erase it, you cannot give it back. So mankind is here to 
develop, mankind is developing knowledge, is gaining more and more knowledge, accumulating more and more knowledge, but this knowledge, you cannot give it back. What is known is known. And we have to live with it. So our path leads us from the quest of knowledge to the control of our destiny. In other words, this statement means that we are the product of the evolution of the universe. But we can now take our own destiny in our hands, control it. I am sure this will be done. One has to be very careful because we can misuse, one can well misuse the knowledge. This is the question of mankind. Mankind has to be clever enough not to misuse it, but it gives us the power to control our own destiny, to change us, to modify us. And I am quite convinced that in the future, we will do it, that humans in a thousand years will not be the same as humans presently. Now, let me finish with a mathematician. I have not said much about mathematics, but let me just uh, uh, cite this David Hilbert, a very famous German mathematician. Why do I cite him? Because he's buried in the cemetery in Göttingen here. And here is his tombstone. And he has written uh, this tombstone. There is written something he said in one of his talks. And let's just look at what is written here, two sentences on this tombstone. First of all, we are müssen wissen, we must know. That means this is what drives us. Uh, this is, we must know, this is our mission. But then this is already a very strong statement. We must know. But then comes even stronger, a conviction, the strong belief, the strong uh, being the conviction, the, the convincing that we will know. We are where than we we will know. We must know, that is what drives science, we want to know. And we will know, that is the underlying goal to know. And our deep conviction that we will know. So here is, again, Prometheus. We will know through science, and he shows high the light, the fire, the, 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 the light of science to show us the way. And for the, especially the young students, I would like to say that science shapes the future of humanity and, and would encourage them to participate. We need more and more science on this world. If we had more science, we would have solved many problems. There's still too much dissension, too much non, uh, lack of understanding, and science will shape the future of humanity. It is the human, uh, the, the human uh, step that can be taken to shape the future and to participate. Now, there's another aspect I would like to stress here. The fact that in addition to knowledge, which we gather, science has an aspect which is also bringing people together from all countries. Science has no flag. Science has no dogma. It is not a nation. It is not a religion. It is not a dogma. Science is above all this. It is above and beyond. It brings together everybody because it is valid everywhere. And the scientific result, which is obtained on our planet Earth, is valid everywhere in the universe. So for us sitting on our planet, it means also that there is no border, there are no separations between people, between scientists, and science brings everybody together. 
like represented in this way by science without borders. All the countries which have evolved historically into different places, different countries in the world, borders don't exist for science. The countries, the countries may be different, cultures may be different, but science is the same for everybody. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Professor Len, for such an inspiring and motivating talk. I think a lot of us who is hearing you today uh, can relate to all the things you said. Um, and uh, today, uh, I think uh, now we can start with the question part. Um, would you be able to answer some questions from oh, the Of course, audience? sure, sure, sure. I'm here for that, sure. Okay, cool. In that case, so we can start uh, with some of the questions have already been uh, published uh, here in the chat. So um, I think first question comes from uh, Gani Istiluf. Um, so I'd like to uh, ask the third question. So he's asking, according to the uh, biochemical theory of evolution, the first amino acid appeared from gases under favorable environmental conditions on early earth. Could you say that recognition systems at the supramolecular chemistry level appeared before the living things and laid a basis for the appearance of life? Yes, of course. That means, you see, uh, I, uh, one slide I should have left in, but I took, I took it out, says the following, that there, has be, there, has, there must have been a purely chemical evolution before there was biological Darwinian evolution. Because you cannot just jump. It's very difficult to imagine that you jump from atoms to a living organism. There must have been progressive steps. And these are physical chemical steps, huh? molecules building up, molecules interacting to make supramolecular objects. And these are steps which are pre-Darwinian, before Darwin. And even Darwinian evolution is chemical evolution. What is it? Darwinian evolution is modifying the genome of the organism. And what is modifying the genome? It's just replacing one chemical group, one of the four letters, which I mentioned, uh, um, where adenine and thymine and uracil and cytosine, if you modify the order, which is just a simple chemical change, you change the organism. So Darwinian evolution is a chemical evolution also. And uh, so, of course, the answer to the question was, sure, there was, a pure, first of all, a non-living evolution based simply on, uh, well, simply, it's not so simple, of course, I said simply, but it's not simple, based on um, the way in which chemical non-living matter can evolve through its interactions, through different, uh, different types of interactions and the generation of more and more complexity, and then, of course, what is life? That is still a question. We still don't know how life has appeared, but life is a, is a, life is a property of uh, matter. Uh, that is what I try to say. It's, uh, of course, we don't understand it right now. And even more, thinking is also a property. Uh, thinking is even more, much more complex than life. And uh, there's a, f a field of chemistry, uh, which, which is, uh, um, called uh, the pre prebiotic chemistry, which tries to understand how molecules could evolve, or let's say molecules and supramolecular entities, assemblies could evolve progressively towards the threshold where life can exist. This is prebiotic chemistry and there are many people and many, uh, so many uh, approaches which have been published so uh, yes, the answer, I, I insist, I say again, it is non-living matter has evolved progressively towards living matter and then living matter because of life has taken up some other forms of evolution. But all of them at the end of it result, uh, are based on a change in the genome, which is a chemical change, very simply. Thank, Thank you. you, Professor. So uh, um, I think uh, the first question I like from Ghani is as well. Uh, it says, how do you think it is possible in future 
to use the achievements of supramolecular chemistry to defeat or slow down the aging process of the human body? Oh, yeah, I would like, very much like to do that. You know, I'm not so young as you are. <laughs> you are a child. <laughs> you are lucky. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, you know, uh, one knows more and more about the process of aging, the fact that uh, tissues become less flexible, that, for instance, skin which is very flexible when you are young and we're very soft and so on, becomes less so. This is due also to lots of things. There can be chemical reactions. There can be radiation from the universe. You know, there's lead radiation coming on. So, uh, it's yes, supramolecular chemistry is just a step in it. It's uh, uh, molecular chemistry is the building, is the basis. Without molecules, there is no life, of course. And then without supramolecular st structures, there's no right either because you have to go from a molecule, the next step to make complex entities. And then you get more and more complex. Let me just give an example. This is a way in which I like usually to represent this evolution, but in a very, very simple way, even trivial way. A single molecule of water, you know what it is, H2O, H-O-H. This cannot boil. It cannot freeze. It has no viscosity. It has no index of refraction. A glass of water can boil, can freeze, has a viscosity, has an index of refraction in, a refraction index. What is the difference? It's still water molecules, but they are together. So to a single isolated water molecule, you add the next step, which is all these interactions which make water to be a liquid in our conditions, of course, of temperature and pressure. So that is a step in complexity, which led to the, to the uh, generation of properties which do not exist at the level of a single molecule. And very complex ones, viscosity is very complex. Boiling, freezing is very complex. So I can understand, uh, this one can imagine, that if you go more and more complex in your organization, features appear which are of higher level, like life. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from Nurbek Akilov. Um, his question is, application of chemistry, chemistry is really wide. Kazakhstan has a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of to do with its education and industry. Which areas of chemistry would you recommend to students to focus? That's a very difficult question because you know all the areas are linked together. I think one very important one is certainly catalysis. The fact that you want to try to optimize transformation of compounds into one another, make them more easy, especially nowadays with the question of uh, being, um, uh, being more efficient, using less energy, using less matter, generating less uh, side products or, uh, uh, or um, uh, yes, less, uh, uh, yes, yeah, side products, let's say. So you want to optimize, you, you want to minimize the consumption of energy, you want to minimize the consumption of matter, and you want to minimize all the side products which are not what you want. And so this triple minimization is uh, catalysis is necessary for doing that. So I think that is a very interesting field. But there is also your chemistry has the uh, interesting feature of being, and is, as it is often called, a central science. It touches physics because by chemical chemistry, you can generate new physical properties. And in nanoscience, nanotechnology, of course, you, it's, uh, it's physics. But on the other hand, without the material, you don't have any physics. Huh? So chemistry can generate these things. On the other, so this is one example on the physical side. It also touches biology, as I mentioned, drugs already. And anyway, a living organism is a bunch of molecules. A living organism is a very, very complex mass organization, very specific, very complex, I repeat, of 
molecules so as to generate something which has this property of life with very complex chemistry going on. But it's based on, uh, it's based on molecules. Our life is molecules and, and uh, interactions and reactions between molecules. Of course, something I should mention also is that for those especially physical chemists in the audience, what I described was all of the examples I gave were examples where the system was what one calls at equilibrium, at thermodynamic equilibrium. Life is not at equilibrium. We know very well that when we die, we are out, sorry, life is out of equilibrium and E equilibrium situation is death. Huh? Something when you were very, uh, living is an out of equilibrium situation. It, it only works because it goes. It's like you see, a simple example, like a bicycle. Huh? On a bicycle, you have to move, otherwise you fall, you fall over. So life has to go, to, go to, 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 to move on in order to, sus to be sustainable. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, in the future, I think uh, chemistry can be very helpful for uh, trying to, to develop systems which will be more and more sustainable. And so catalysis is one, the uh, interface with biology. Uh, I am also convinced that, look, let's, let me just take an example. Maybe most of you perhaps have not, have heard about one thing, but not about the reason. You know that in this present crisis, COVID crisis, new vaccines have been developed. And especially the RNA, the uh, ribonucleic acid vaccines, vaccines based on RNA. Huh? And what has been done there? This, they are very, these are the most successful ones right now. And in, the change, uh, in order to make it possible, I, it's, a, it's a bit a long story, so I cannot say everything, but in order to make it possible, the people who developed it, and this was uh, a lady, Catalin Carico, and uh, a person from, uh, 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 have one of her colleagues, Drew Weissman, what was done is simply to slightly change the connection between uh, one of the nuclear bases, one of those letters, with the, the way they are attached, just moving it by one step around. In other words, for the people who are uh, biologists, go and make uh, replacing a uridine by the pseudo uridine. For those who are bio biochemists, they will understand what it means. In other words, a very simple chemical change has made it possible. So, I am quite convinced that in the future we'll have more, much more of this, where we will be able to control much better um, and use the power of chemistry to make, uh, to modify uh, the, um, to, to modify a chemical compound, which is very close to the natural one, but if you modify it just a little, it will acquire properties, which the, uh, the, the starting one, doesn't have. And uh, this has been done with these RNA vaccines, where just a simple, a simple replacement by uh, one chemical compound by shifting a little bit of group to one side, from one side to another side, was enough to be able to develop. Okay, maybe, uh, of course, there was a lot of work done. This is not, I don't want to show, say that this is, uh, has, has been very simple. They have to, had to do a lot of research on it. But nevertheless, it's a simple change which shows the power well, of the interference, the power in which chemistry can interfere with biological processes and open uh, possibilities which didn't exist before. Great, thank you. I think the next question is somewhat related. Um, it's also from Ghani. He said, he's asking which drugs obtained with the help of supramolecular chemistry have been most widely used? Uh, this is almost impossible to answer because as I said, all drugs are a lock and key affair. 
So from the moment you you want, uh, I said, there is no drug which hasn't been using supramolecular effects. So. Now, which has been widely used? I mean, there are many drugs, antibiotics. Now, antibiotics are usually extracted from plants or from uh, microorganisms, penicillin and so on. But the result of it is that a penicillin molecule interacts with a biological target. And this is a supramolecular effect. The interaction of penicillin with its target, with its target is a supramolecular interaction. So a drug by definition is a key which must interact in a supramolecular way with the biological lock, the biological target. So uh, the answer is all drugs, whatever they are, are based on, first of all, the molecular structure, and then its interaction, very specific, as specific as possible, with its biological target. Great, thank you. I have my uh, own question regarding uh, drugs. So uh, in recent uh, years in biochemistry, um, targeted drug delivery um, has been a big topic um, of investigation. And there are many, many different vehicles uh, for targeted drug delivery have been invented. Some of them also include the supramolecular uh, compounds uh, that can host the drug and, and be um, sent uh, to the organism to deliver that drug to a particular place, for instance, infected cell or stuff yeah, like yeah. that. So uh, comparing to other uh, vehicles that has been um, invented, for instance, um, uh, poros, poros silica shells or dendritic uh, uh, structures and all that, how, um, what's the advantage of supramolecular vehicles that are uh, being uh, employed these days in research? What's, what's the advantage over the other more hard, more, more rigid sort of vehicles? Yeah, um, of course, the, the end interaction is always supramolecular. Now, the vehicle uh, you would like to have, uh, if you have, let's say, a silica, silica uh, shell, that one is, it is interacting, but it's not very selective. So you have to attach to it some uh, recognition groups, which will lead it to a given target. And that is what, what has been done. And there are of course, nano, nanoparticles, which one can make into which, uh, yeah, the idea there is, as you know, is that you can make shells, empty silica sh shells, and then put the drug inside, but then you have to attach to it some recognition groups which will bring it to the right target. In fact, this was a little bit also what has, uh, when I showed this uh, medical diagnostics uh, apparatus, which I had on one slide, there, the label is this europium complex, the europium entity, which, which has a red luminescence, but the recognition which brings it somewhere is an immunoprotein. So in fact, it's a combination of the recognition, the recognition part, which is the immunoprotein, which does the recognition, and the detection, which is the uh, red fluorescence. That is a little bit what you are, what you are saying. The, the object which gives a red fluorescence has uh, it's not, not highly selective. And so you, at, you attach it to a very selective immunoprotein, which then will find out and recognize a target. Very and you know that, I mean, there are many people now, nano, nano, nanomedicine is developing where one uses nanostructured materials, very, very small uh, size, uh, sizes uh, vehicles. Uh, but they need then some kind of a recognition uh, unit which brings in the recognition process, which is super molecular then, of course. Great, thank you. Um, another question related to supramolecular chemistry would be um, synthesis of new uh, chemical species in, in the cavity of supramolecular structures. Um, can you uh, tell more about the perspective of this field? The perspective of what? Of uh, synthesizing um, chemical species in the cavity of supramolecular st structures. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is something interesting, sure, to be able to introduce, for instance, in, into a silica shell, um, let's see, enzymes, substrates, and let them then operate. It's an interesting possibility to bring a, a whole reactive system into, into a biological organism. Um, yeah, <clears throat> but I think it's certainly something which is interesting because you then, in addition to just bringing a drug somewhere, you may bring it together with some kind of a reaction which may make it more efficient, which will make it uh, do something else, like uh, reacting with the, uh, with the site where it binds to. That's a possibility also to have it uh, record, to have it going to a given target and then reacting with the target. I see. Thank you. Um, another interesting question I had in mind was: um, Is it possible to combine, um, for instance, uh, like last year's, for instance, Nobel Prize went for invention of the. Um, uh, CAS, uh, CRIS CAS9 system, yeah. uh, editing system. Is this system can be used to create uh, supramolecular structures out of, let's say, RNAs, uh, DNAs, and stuff like that? So, possibility of using these uh, things for making supramolecular structures because it's possible to edit them, right? So, what's your opinion on this? Yes, you know, the, the basis is that all these things are supramolecular, huh? they, they operate in that way. Uh, this uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, needs a directing unit. Uh, Cas9, uh, it, it, it has a recognition between uh, protein and, uh, of course, and um, uh, nucleic acids. So altogether, uh, it is, you know, the thing is that you cannot escape supramolecular because it's there. It's like a molecule. You cannot escape molecules because molecules are here. And once you have molecules, you cannot escape supramolecular effects because the molecules are here. From the moment the molecules get together, it's supramolecular. So all these uh, technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 or like vaccines or like uh, other drugs, uh, also the question which was raised before about aging, there, all these are supramolecular things. Huh? The fact that skin gets less flexible, less soft, this is, has to do, now it has also to do, of course, with molecular at the, at the level where the molecules are modified, but then the interactions between them change. And so, um, uh, yeah, it's, I cannot say anything else than saying supramolecular is everywhere. From the moment you have molecules, you have supramolecules. Right, thank you. Is there any other question from the audience? If there is, um, you can um, ask directly or write it in the chat so I can um, read it to the Professor Len. Okay, maybe I have one general question. So um, can you please comment on um, the importance of um, imagination in, 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 in research, in science? Um, how one can be inspired or, or from something or imagine something because also the, all these things um, need certain human imagination, right, to create. I know it's like a step-by-step sure. -step process, but um, I'm sure there are certain things that, that, that one, can, one can be inspired or imagine it. But how, uh, how, how, does, how does it happen for you, for instance? Yeah. Imagination is very, very important because uh, imagination is the way to... Let's see, uh, one could say imagination is, is a way to cover many, many diverse possibilities. When you imagine something, you, 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 you think about many diverse features. And so this, and, but then of course, the question is, there, there must be two steps. One is imagination. And then the detection of whether what you have imagined is interesting or is worth it. It is the imagination is like one could say the imagination has no um, no scale of uh, importance. It is just selecting, generating diversity, diversity, diversity. 
And then this diversity, you have to act on the diversity to be able to find out which in this enormous amount of possibilities is an interesting one. And so, yeah, let, um, a little bit, if I change a little bit uh, your question, um, what I have often recommended, but of course one can also recommend other things, but a number of young students have asked me, uh, what, <clears throat> what should we do to be successful in science? Of course, as I just said, imagination is very important, Se but then selecting the right type of imagination, the right type of outcome, uh, because it's not, not anything is good, but so um, some uh, um, is, uh, yeah, I could, I, I, the examples I, I give is just a sort of a, uh, let's say a recommendation. First of all is don't miss the train. I mean by that, when in your imagination or when, um, uh, when uh, events which happen around you generate a lot of different possibilities with the petition, don't miss the one which is important. Don't miss the train. Huh? You can imagine many things, but you have at some stage to be able to realize that this one is important. And so don't miss the train. This happens to me many times where um, uh, the result of an experiment it was something interesting, but the experiment wanted to tell us something else. It wanted to tell us that there is something here to be looked at, which is maybe more interesting than what you were looking for. The second recommendation is don't jump on a train. With, don't try to jump on a train which has already left. This is this, this mode, the effect of a, of a mode uh, that, um, of a fashion. So fashions are, to some extent, for some time, they are good because they, they, um, they give more power to the investigation in a given area. But sometimes also these fashions then become too blown up and uh, that uh, then you, you, many people run into the same direction, whereas there are many other ones which are interesting directions. And the third recommendation, which has to do with... Uh, also a sort of, not imagination, but an, it's a sort of an important technique for making, let's say, discoveries. It is to say, think perpendicular. In other words, if you have been taught all your life that this is the good result and this is the way to think, ask yourself, and if I think differently, what would happen? In many cases, it is stupid, what, nothing comes out of it. But in a number of cases, just asking the question, what would happen? What would my field be if I, rather than following the path which has been followed all the time, I just say, I oppose to that. Let me just think perpendicular, think differently and try to see what it gives. As I said, in most cases, it is not very interesting because it leads you to wrong directions. But in some cases, just asking the question of changing totally the point of view, which people also say, think out of the box, don't be in a box, try to think out, stick your head out. And uh, this, is, um, this is, I think, a very important thing to do. And um, yeah. <clears throat> This is there's a Chinese poet who said that if you sit at the bottom of a well, the sky will seem very small. Huh? You, see, you sit in a hole, then the sky is very narrow. You have to stick your head out of the box and then you see what is around you. Great, thank you so much for these recommendations, I think. Uh, we can learn a lot from these advices for all of us who are listening today. Um, I think the audience does not have uh, many questions, at least it didn't appear in the chat. So um, I guess with this, we will thank you again, once again, on the behalf of the organization committee and all the participants. 
and wish you health and, and a lot of um, great uh, work in the lab and uh, achievements in science. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much. Ted, it would even be nicer to be there, but okay. Definitely, uh, we are. We, we you're very welcome to visit us uh, uh, in Kazakhstan. There are many, many great places and great universities. I hope there will be time after all this finished with the pandemic that uh, you can finally visit us and, and see uh, our audience and our developments uh, we, uh, in person. I hope it will happen very soon. Yeah. From me, all best wishes and uh, for doing good research, interesting research, and developing your country, your universities, and your people. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Армандар алға жетелегенде. Білім жетістікке ұласқанда. Шабыттар бірге шыңдалғанда. Бейік белестерге қадам басқанда. Омытылмас сәттерде өз арманыңды басқара бе? Ауэзов Юниверситет. События 2020 года. Пандемия, самоизоляция, локдауны. Да, но не только они. 2020 год — это плюс 15 тысяч шибановцев. Новые лаборатории и кабинеты. Новые возможности Smart University. Создан автономный образовательный портал собственной системой прокторинга. Увеличено количество услуг Smart Arsu. Проведена неделя цифровизации. Достижения ученых. Учеными выиграны гранты на 160 миллионов тенге. Под руководством профессора Конышбека Шункеева разработан учебник по физике для школьников Казахстана. Открыт диссертационный совет на соискание степени PHD по филологии. Защищена диссертация по математике. Успехи студентов. Волонтерские организации и школа волонтеров стали лучшими проектами области. Проведен международный студенческий семинар «Перспективы развития студенческого самоуправления в эпоху цифровизации». Участники стартап Академии выиграли гранты на свои проекты почти на 3 миллиона тенге. Международное признание. Университет стал соорганизатором международной конференции QS. Жбанов Университет впервые вошел в международный рейтинг QS University Rankings и ECA и занял 351 место среди лучших вузов. Год Абая. Имя и наследие Абая стало ближе тысячам казахстанцев. Проведено множество мероприятий и конкурсов. Опубликовано несколько научных трудов. Книга о Байтану передана во все школьные библиотеки области. И, конечно же, 2020 – это юбилейный год университета Жубанова. Проведено 85 благотворительных мероприятий. 503 человека награждены юбилейными медалями. 85 педагогов получили премии от областной профсоюзной организации работников образования и науки. Выпускники Активинской области стали обладателями 85 грантов имени Кудобергена Шубанова. Зарегистрировано 85 патентов. Учеными факультетами передано в библиотеку по 85 книг. Студентами реализовано 85 стартап-проектов. В 2020 году Жубанов Университет перелистнул 85-ю страницу своей истории, чтобы с новыми целями идти вперед вместе с вами.